Gunders, that was a very powerful um, account of what cities feel like to be in and how we love them and protect them. But as I, as I was listening to you, I, I wondered how you feel about a city which now has almost 16 million people. That 15 and a half million who swell this place, are they still Istanbul? Is there Istanbul another Istanbul? Has the sheer scale and size of the city changed the things that you love? I really can't answer that question because we never ask that question to the people who live in Istanbul. I don't want to be, make a counter argument, but unfortunately we don't listen to them. I suppose my point is that um, the, the historical city you describe, what we see from these amazing windows, is not the day-to-day -day experience of so much of the city. And I wonder if one can still, see, how, how do these two cities connect? I mean, it's my feeling that really all who come to Istanbul indeed do have a sense of history, that they have a realization of the past of Istanbul. You know that it's even reflected in the lullabies and the songs and the references of the people to the past, that you can have a waiter in a Turkish restaurant singing songs going back as far as five centuries, yet also still humming to a song of the Beatles. So are we creating new foundation myths about the city all the time? I think the language of the city is changing constantly. And I think that we are aware of a change in the language. What keeps us from being aware of the language is those who insist on one language per city. I've always understood a city as being about choices. and. Yeah. Um, the more successful the city, the more choice it offers, the more it enables people to make their own city out of the ingredients that are there. Sukhetu. And I have a design for airports as well. <laughs> That's easier than designing cities, but at airports, we're in one mass shopping mall at the moment, sitting next to each other, ordered to sit in such a way that we can't communicate, and we're not even meant to communicate with each other. And here is the world at the airport, people going to different places, coming from different places, not being able to exchange just one word. And thank you, architects, for making these airports so that we can't communicate. Why not have airports before we start with the cities, designed in such, such a way with a museum, with entertainment, with music, with round sitting facilities where we can talk to each other? then let us be introduced to the cities or let us leave the cities in that fashion. It's just that our way of thinking has been so oriented to specific chain market oriented formulas that we really address different needs perhaps, but not the personal. Richard, does this um, chime with your vision of a city which should be vaguer and less defined, which is I think what I understood you to be saying? There it is. Don't, oh, I see what you're doing. Um, no, I think it's, I think what I'm uh, talking about is uh, a little more in line with what Suketu was talking about, uh, which is uh, that often when we talk about urban culture, uh, we talk about the place as being somehow something that defines a, a specific set of feelings, uh, almost like a, a kind of um, a behavior experiment. And what I think is happening to local places now is that uh, people are making out of their sense of place much more of a kind of narrative. I don't agree with either of you that our, I, it's very easy to demonize architects. I, I, and it's, it's a wonderful game. You know, it's very satisfying because mostly they're horrible. But it's one of those things, you know, that we need. Uh, and I think the trick for me in urban design now is how to design places that people uh, can inhabit rather than simply succumb uh, 
uh, to a dictate. Uh, uh, the space tells you to do X or Y. Uh, another way to think about this is that a lot of modern building is very brittle. It lasts for a while, then it breaks. And that's a, that's a technical and aesthetic problem within design. That is, that we aren't creating, in the root sense of sustainable architecture, kinds of architecture that can live over long periods of time. There's not much interest in modern capitalism in creating that kind of architecture and sustainable architecture in that fundamental way. And an architecture like that doesn't allow adaptation and inhabitation. So I think where Suketo and I are on the same wavelength is what kinds of physical environments, how can we make them so that people adapt them to life narratives, which as I was trying to ex explain, are themselves no longer fixed in a kind of linear time. And that's a real challenge for the designer, to respond to a kind of life narrative which is no longer linear. Uh, so I, I, I'm afraid I'm a little on the opposite side from both of you. That, that, that is a technical problem, and it's an aesthetic problem of design. It's, it's some way in which buildings allow people to do this work of habitation. And we're very bad at it. And as we've you know, been making these, uh, these tours around the world, what, what you see again and again is a very overdetermined architecture that's not allowing habitation to go on. It lasts for a while, usually for the length of a mortgage. Uh, and, uh, uh, then it's finished. Can I ask a question to Mahda, please, at this point? Actually, um, he was talking about the uh, official and the unofficial stories and the narratives. This is, again, one of the most important subject matters under discussion in Turkey, and it has been debated uh, in the recent years. That is the narrative history, uh, the official history narrated uh, through the ages, and uh, it's now, uh, th there's this argument that as we go away from that uh, official history narrated and imposed on the generations, we're becoming more and more democratic regarding this uh, architectural approach to the cities and also the aesthetics uh, together with the democratization of the Cities. Would you mind that this official and the, would you think that this official and the clash of the official and the unofficial stories do create in themselves a kind of aesthetics of democracy which goes more for a less determinate, as Professor Sennett was saying, more flexible uh, in the city space? Because I have also the uh, basic uh, uh, belief that I have developed in the recent years that we were before talking about the problem of the implosion of the cities. Now we're more talking about the problem of the explosion that we witness in the cities regarding all the suburban developments and other things. And Istanbul, don't ever forget that in the last 15 years, received 7.5 million of immigrants, which are now located in the peripheral, you know, ur suburbia as city dwellers, still having contacts with the urban spaces and coming here together with their own narratives of history in a very, of course, authentic way. So how would you elaborate on these? Um, as I said in my talk, there is this unofficial story and the official story. Both, of course, are important. Um, when I was writing my book on Bombay, um, I found the official history of Bombay remarkably well catalogued. Um, there were libraries like the uh, Asiatic Library and um, even commercial libraries where um, corporations had their histories, which I looked at the official gazetteers of the uh, British colonialists. What I could not find 
was chronicles of um, the life of people in the native towns um, because they wrote, well, not many of them were uh, literate to begin with, but when they wrote, it was true in the form of these little postcards on which every available inch of space was crawled over. Um, so even when I could understand the language, uh, it was really dense writing because they needed to pack in as much information as they could. Um, and some of these postcards were in my own family that uh, people who were living in Bombay sent back to the village in Gujarat. So this, um, I think this, this persists today. Um, even now, when we look at uh, the large cities uh, of the globe, it's very easy to get the official story because it is marketed by armies of public relations people. Um, and it's, uh, you can you know, get it easily enough on the internet. It's packaged in an accessible format. So the resistance to the official story is much quieter. Um, you either go to um, activists, and you know, some of their motives are suspect, um, but you actually go into walking around the slums, for example, just outside of this hall is this wonderful um, old town where I went walking around a couple of days ago, and it really reminded me of a small town in India with all these little um, shops that uh, were either very specialized or sold everything uh, in one small space, and little residences and shops. And uh, I felt that if I were to be studying Istanbul, that's where I would begin, from the bottom up. Um, you, uh, one thing I wanted to uh, mention was when um, uh, Richard, I uh, didn't intend to demonize architects. Some of my best friends are architects, uh, <laughs> even though I might not let my sister marry one, but um, the, the, I think the, the problem with the kind of architecture that we're seeing um, the architecture that has replaced the slums in uh, all over the world is that it seems all to have been designed by one bad architect. Uh, it, uh, the uh, public housing I saw in Rio looks exactly like the public housing in Mumbai, looks exactly like the public housing in Istanbul. So who is this Uber architect who's designing all these buildings? Um, I, I know... Uh, uh, of architects who are trying to work with people and um, you know, work with the slum dwellers um, in improving what they already have built. So I think what we need is uh, our architectural academies to turn out um, teams of architects uh, and direct them to first of all go learn the local languages uh, and then to listen. Before you plan, before you draw blueprints, just go and listen. If I might um, interrupt as an ex-architect or an escaped architect, I think architects are themselves primary storytellers. And one of the stories they've told too often is their omnipotence, which uh, allows people to take that omnipotence seriously and then assume that this omnipotence is to blame for something which is a more complex product of, of the world. I was going to ask you really about some of the things that you were saying about the responsibility of journalism to question narratives and stories. And I, when you came back from the podium, I whispered the words nostalgia in, in your ear because, of course, what you're describing is a form which is dying. Um, who is going to ask these questions in this future? Another thought that comes to me also is the sense that um, those postcards written by the official writers um, surely now being replaced by f are being replaced by Facebook, which will never go away. Can, can I add just one, sen one sentence? You mentioned the letter writers. In Turkey, there were people sitting next to the government offices writing the petitions for the people, actually. And they are already being filed as a matter of... Uh, unofficial uh, stories. I just wanted to make sure, rather than the letter writers, 
they were, of course, writing some letters, but rather they are known and uh, they were doing the job of a petition writer for the government offices. Uh, that's right. One of my ancestors was a scribe. Uh, one of my ancestors He's talking was about a the letters written to the uh, presidents and the prime ministers by the people asking for jobs and everything. They filed, of course, for years and years. Yes, they were known as firmans in India, and one of my ancestors was a scribe for the king of, well, uh, uh, one of the uh, nawabs of this um, area of Gujarat where uh, the nawab uh, spoke, and my ancestor uh, uh, took dictation. So those records we have access to. It's the other um, letters, and well, now uh, I, I realize that a lot of these migrants conduct their communications, not just through Facebook, but through Skype. So they go into these internet places in Jackson Heights. And, but unfortunately, I don't know if um, uh, they are uh, kept, they're, they're recorded. I know that it, there's a change in universities um, so that these smaller stories, I mean, attention is being paid to them. But your point about the press, about um, this kind of journalism, uh, of this kind of investigative journalism dying right now, I think is well taken. Um, the great American journalist A.J. Liebling once said, America has freedom of the press for those who own one. Um, so again, this is a, a place where, uh, you know, in India it's quite blatant. Uh, uh, most of the newspapers are owned by various industrial houses, and the editors and the reporters are expected to uh, kill negative stories about the industrial house that, that owns the paper. It's uh, maybe a little less subtle uh, in the West, but still, it's, it's one of the jobs of journalists not just to investigate these matters. I mean, there's not a lot of investigation to be done in an urban plan, but the problem also is that many of the journalists who cover issues of architecture and planning um, aren't well educated in these issues. They don't come to conferences like this. So um, with the, the resources of the newspapers and the magazines coming under tremendous strain, they stick in the first general assignment reported that they can find and you know, go cover the redevelopment of Coney Island, uh, which is one topic that is crucial to the future of New York City. But um, if you were to look for an article that just explained the issues, in an interesting way, um, you'd be hard pressed to find one. Uh, so we need journalists who can not only investigate malfeasance, but tell a story about cities and about planning, because there is a really riveting story to be told. I think I responded too hastily to your immediate question, your first question about how much people felt themselves to be a part of Istanbul. I was too excited by my delivery there. But uh, what I really want to say, and it follows up on I think a bit what you said, that there's a, with the disen disenfranchisement in the city, there's a sort of a feeling of immediate belonging and constant change. In the sense that well, a very typical example is you get on the very crowded Istanbul buses. They're not as crowded now as they used to be. And because it's so crowded, of course, you start pushing people toward the back. And you say, hey, those in the back, we can't breathe. Move back. So it's us here, immediate belonging. And it's them back there saying, don't push us. But three stops later, you're in the back. And now you have an immediate sense of belonging to the back, saying those up front don't push us. And I think with the changing daily issues that we find ourselves sort of stuck in corners, stuck with issues, and just trying to fend our own turf for that immediate moment or immediate day, rather than partaking in the city's affairs through various associations or having a voice in the city. Thank you. I, th I think we're running out of time, so I'd just like to thank Richard Suketu and Gunduz for 
giving us a very illuminating view of the city as a story which will go on telling. Thank you. And to Richard Sanabe as well. Thank you very much for your interest.